Okay, it's three o'clock. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech. More specifically, this is Energy in America. And that's Lou Pugliarici, the handsome fellow on the other side. Uh, and the title of our show is uh, The International Energy Agency Releases Its Post-COVID World Energy Outlook. I'm so interested to hear what happened here. But you know, first, Lou, welcome to the show. And second, what is the International Energy Agency? So I thought we should talk about that for a second. So if you recall, um, perhaps you and I are the only ones who could think back this far. In <laughs> 1973 and 74, we had enormous gas lines in the United States. Uh, I thought you had them in Hawaii, but in the continental United States, in, in the mainland, we certainly had them. And the United States and much of the Western world who were large net importers of crude oil and petroleum products um, suffered under an embargo by certain uh, Arab members of the organization of uh, you know, the oil exporting states or OPEC. And that uh, disruption was viewed as enormous, a serious, uh, as a, a serious secure, not just an economic, but a security threat to the industrialized uh, democracies. At the time, we were still in a major confrontation with the Soviet Union. Uh, China was just a kind of, uh, you know, the, the you know, the, uh, what you call the, the uh, you know, the hidden kingdom or the dark kingdom. We didn't know much about China except that Mao was there. And uh, there was enormous concern. So Henry Kissinger and the Western began to negotiate a joint agreement between the major industrialized democracies, a kind of subset of NATO or mostly NATO countries to share supplies in an oil emergency and begin to undertake collective action, including a lot of research on what we should do about the growing problem of, uh, and the security threat from the importation of insecure and expensive imports of crude oil. And so the IEA was born in that period. And since then, it's uh, a membership has expanded with the OEC as the OECD has expanded. It even has a number of associate members uh, and has regular contact with uh, countries who are not members such as China and India. So, so the International Energy Agency is now the considered many respects, not only the gold standard and what's happening to world petroleum markets or what's, what should we do about policies, it has also taken on the mantle of looking at what does the West need to do to address the climate threat. Oh, interesting. So what, what, what uh, influence does it have? What power does it have? So part of its power is that the ministers, the energy ministers or economic ministers of the major OECD countries uh, participate in its proceedings. They give policy advice and guide it, guide its direction. So it's, it has a lot of standing as a political institution, but it's also, it's, although we might from time to time quibble with some of their uh, estimates and the kinds of things they work on, I would say they are considered quite authoritative on what's happening into world energy markets. Not only that, what the future, what does the future look like in all kinds of areas, nuclear power, renewables, oil and gas, uh, what, what's the nature of the climate challenge in front of us and what we, should we be doing to address it? This is major. How yeah. often do they meet? Where do they meet? Do they rotate? So they have uh, the International Energy Agency has a full-time uh, director, executive director. It's a political appointment that rotates, but it's now by a man by the name of Fatih Birol. He is a Turk. He has been in that position for well over six or seven years. I presume it will rotate at some time. In the past, generally the way it works is a non-US member is the executive director and a US member is always the deputy director. So it's part of our deal with the European. Traditionally, it's been a European, although a few years ago, 
we did have a Japanese uh, executive director and uh, the it, it's a it's a very important organization in the world energy community does it stand in in good graces with this administration uh, so many international uh, agencies have been shunned. As far as I know, yes, it was quite active in the recent uh, negotiations with OPEC. It played a large role in the negotiations with OPEC and what, during the first stages of the demand collapse. Um, DOE and uh, Secretary uh, Secretary Boulet uh, regularly attends meetings there. Fatih Barol has met with President Trump. It is a, uh, and it's an organization that has recorded extensively both the uh, unconventional revolution in oil and gas production in the US and the shale gas revolution. Mm -hmm. And it is a big proponent of the expansion of natural gas as a bridge fuel for addressing climate uh, issues. Okay, so you, you mentioned that you mentioned that they're interested this organization was called the IEA yes. um, has has um, has interest and uh, tries to develop policy around climate change. But what about renewables? Uh, I hate to use this term, but what about green energy? So it does a lot of work on green energy. It uh, provides guidance on uh, strategies for implementing uh, aggressive uh, green energy strategies, wind and solar. Many of their reports, some of their reports they charge money for because they're suffering a budget uh, constraints like all of us, but much of their work is available uh, in open source material. So, and okay, you can so. see their work. They've done a lot of work on, uh, and, and they do these major audits. They do an audit uh, of uh, other members like Mexico or Switzerland or France. And they, I think they've done some major assessments of China and India as well. And these are public? These are all public. Everything, everything is published. Occasionally you have to pay for it, but everything is published. So if I, if I go to their website, it's easy enough to find it. Uh, the International Energy Agency, I'll be able yeah. to find a lot of their work there. You will, you will. And we have, uh, we have presented before the staff there and uh, we've participated in both uh, OECD programs and IEA programs in other countries. Okay, so let's get let's get to the meat here. This is uh, this is the outlook. I guess that's a report so once that they a, released. This is quite important. Once a year, they put together a long term outlook, and mm -hmm. they try to look out 20, 30 years. Now, looking out 20, 30 years in the energy world is a mugs game, so to speak. It's uh, <laughs> it's very tough to do. We are in the process ourselves now at looking at the history of energy modeling. And uh, I'm, I should have shown you one of the charts. It's just hilarious. Uh, the ability to figure out what the future holds, even with a lot of brain power, is enormously difficult. And there are a lot of surprises on the technology side, a lot of surprises on consumer behavior, and there's a lot of, surpri there's a lot of surprises on the supply side. For example, the shale gas revolution in the United States was a major world disruptive event in the sense that I would say five, uh, 10 years ago, 10 to 12 years ago, US energy planners, US capital expenditures were being spent at huge, huge rates and including large plans for the US to build importation facilities for LNG. And we're talking at one time, the plans were for as much as 40 major LNG importation facilities throughout the United States. And natural gas now, which is priced at $2.88 or $3, was routinely priced in the United States at 10 to $12 a thousand cubic feet or a million BTU. So you could think about what the disruptive nature of that is. In a very short time, the US went from expectations of becoming a major importer of natural gas to now expectations of being a major exporter of natural gas. 
Yeah, it's an interesting all in the past few years. But and, you know, you, you didn't mention just, other just factors. A little, a little comment in there. All these people who want to stop shale production. Well, have they succeeded? If they had thought about it. If they knew it was coming and they had been able to stop it uh, 15 years ago, we would be a major importer of natural gas and dependent upon everything from um, Arab sheikdoms to uh, other, other uh, less than uh, friendly uh, sources for our natural gas. You didn't mention um, other factors that might affect the, the planning process. And I, I, let me throw some things that come to my mind about it. Number one is um, you, you do have activist groups around the world. Um, I'm not sure how strong they are relative to a year or two ago. I mean, COVID has affected everything. Um, but um, that's a factor that would, that would certainly influence planning. The, uh, the other factor that strikes me is the geopolitical uh, developments. I mean, for example, hostilities, um, border skirmishes, um, you know, uh, uh, supply demand. You did mention supply demand, but supply demand arguments. Uh, for example, the, the pipeline from Russia to Germany. Mm. Um, those, those things could affect planning and you don't know how it's gonna work out. Yes, of course, the U.S. has taken a very hard line uh, on that. I mean, presumably Putin is Trump's friend, but he's taken an extremely hard line on that pipeline. But Angela Merkel is not uh, going for that. She sees the political relationship with Russia at a different plane than the, the Nord Stream 2 project, which is this pipeline you're talking about, uh, as a commercial project, which is separate from the political relationship with Russia. Hopefully so. Uh, but let me ask you one more question before we get into the slides and you know a substantive discussion of their outlook on, on post-COVID. Um, you know, we recently had this deal between Israel and the Emirates. Um, how, does, how does that, and, and thus a change in the complexion of the Middle East, a change in the tone, if you will, of the geopolitical, the geopolitics in the Middle East have changed, I mean, rather quickly. So uh, and query, how does that affect the whole, you know, energy uh, phenomenon? Well, the actually, that, that's an interesting point that people haven't talked too much about. If you think about the shift in expectations, partly because of, in a lot, not just because of, but largely because of the shale gas, oil and gas revolution in the U.S. And the, sh and the U.S. as a energy dominant player if you like the trump one, but actually a net export if you take canada and mexico and our integrated market the you the north america is a net exporter of oil and gas to the world market. we are not a net importer so when you shift out all the pluses and the minus more oil and gas goes out of north america than comes in and so that is probably be one of the main features that the long run price of oil is going to be closer to $50 a barrel than it is going to be 100. And the long run price of gas is traded in the uh, Asia Pacific markets, probably going to be closer to $6 than it is to $12 or $14. And that has had a big effect on many petro states. It's lowered their, uh, their outlook their income, it's reduced their, their geopolitical maneuverability, it's hurt their leverage, particularly in regional rivalries. And I would suggest it probably does factor into the fact, into the, I mean, Iran does as well, but the era, I would say the Gulf Arab states very much worried about Iran. Uh, their ability to wield the oil weapon as a leverage against the Western powers is a lot more difficult and probably making peace with Israel is not a bad outcome for them right now. Mm, yeah. Okay, well, let's, uh, let's talk about the report itself uh, from the IEA. You have a bunch of slides. This is gonna be really interesting to yeah. see what they think and in, in the context of a very difficult planning process. Yeah, so let's take a look first at what happened. Let's look at the first picture. So I think this is very interesting. So this shows you what happened in one year. And so and there's several, uh, 
let's say metrics here that are worth looking at. The first one, as you can see, is coal. So coal consumption in the world has declined by 7% in just one year. And by the way, uh, EPRINC, along with probably our, our sister think tank in Japan, and with uh, some experts from China and India, are going to do a webinar on uh, is, uh, is the demise of coal, uh, you know, the potential death of coal, is it overestimated? And I think it's going to be very interesting because of the post-COVID era, we think there's going to be some resistance to moving away from coal to more expensive fuels. And we're going to have a little discussion about that. Uh -huh. You can see here that, and, and by the way, these numbers, like the reduction in, cat, in gas, the percentage reduction in oil, all of these are because demand has collapsed around the world. It's not that all of a sudden people said, okay, well, let's, let's, save, let's save some energy and let's go green. That's not what's happening. People ran out of money. They stopped driving. They stopped using. Factories were shut down. And this is what happened. Uh, nuclear power, uh, consumption of nuclear power has declined. Interestingly enough, there's continued to be some momentum growth for renewables. You can see that here, about a 1%, less than 1%. But total energy demand, and by the way, these are colossal numbers. We have never seen anything like this. Usually what happens, demand might flatten out and people will argue over whether it's gonna go 3% or 2% or 4%. To see demand drop like this at, a, at such a massive amount is really unprecedented. And of course, one of the benefits of this is we've had a major reduction in CO2 emissions, right? You can see total energy demand, CO2 emissions are down, down 7%. So while you're sitting at Starbucks with no job, you can take, you can take uh, you know, uh, solace in the fact that you're Carbon footprint is going down really quite rapidly. And then finally, the thing that's very worrisome to me is the massive loss in energy investment. You can see that as the prices of these uh, energy commodities have declined, energy investment has dropped by 18%. Does that mean loss of investment or uh, a reduction in investment going forward? Yeah, so there was, let's say we were going to invest 100 now for the plans were for 2020. This is versus not whatever we invested in 2019, we invested 18% less. So we invested $100 in, uh, in uh, 2019, we're down to $82. In you know, what's interesting about that is in investors, that uh, investors are always looking to the future. Um, they're trying to figure out what's going to happen. And when you see that kind of reduction, and it's a statement by, I guess, a lot of investors for a, a lot of investment where they don't believe that this chart is going to recover back to normalcy. And we'll time. talk about that. I do think that there is, we've seen this before where uh, one of the problems with oil and gas is it's a long-term play. And, it, but what happens is cash, I, it doesn't really fit into traditional economic theory, but cash flow makes a difference. And if, uh, if people stop buying your stuff, your cash flow falls and your board of directors and your stockholders say, look, you have to stop the bleeding. And you might go around and say, look, you know, this is a good idea in 10 years, we're gonna need this. Well, they say, okay, let's, let's wait a while before we decide that. So I, I do think this is a, a, good, a good point because we may pay the piper on the other end of this mm -hmm. in terms of higher prices. Now, if you look at that- You know, one, one thing to ask though, uh, Lou, is that, you know, okay, so I have less uh, economic activity, less emissions, um, and, um, and there's a connection, obviously, between the amount of investment uh, in energy in general, because the demand is so reduced. But what was the lag time between the time it was obvious that the economies of the world were declining uh, and the time th the prices declined and the investment declined? Did they get well, it right was, away or did it take a oh, while? It was, right, it was very, of course, it took a few, it, it was weeks, not months. 
Mm. Because when the demand, that's such an unprecedented, you know, I've heard one commentator say, look, it's as if the government, because they did the lockdown, drove an F-150 through your front window. <laughs> uh, that was a big loss and you took it immediately. Mm -hmm. And this is part of my personal view that lockdown, the consequences of lockdown have now become so widespread, so devastating. No government is going to do it again. They might do selected uh, protections of, of the geezer population, you know, people like me, but they're not going, we're not going to see massive lockdowns anywhere in the world. Going forward. I think it's clear. Perhaps that maybe China. Learned, we've learned a few things about lockdown. We learned. Hopefully, we've gotten smart. Yeah, and and we it's a nuanced, or it should be a nuanced approach. So, if you look at average annual growth going out the next, if you look at the next, say the next uh, ten to fifteen years, in ten years, the IEA has now looked at a comparison of what they call pre-crisis stated policy scenario. So stated policy scenario is what business as usual as we're organized now, whatever feed in tariffs we have, whatever we have now, that we view that as kind of set. Nothing new, but no rollback. So that's the blue bar. And that delayed recovery scenario in which uh, we have further development and uh, we don't, uh, we're not, you know, we're actually pulling back a bit. I think it's interesting to look at. And so if we look at what primary energy demand looks like going forward, it gives us a sense of what it's going to take to get back to where we were in 2019. You know, what year can we get back in 2019 given what's happening now on these two scenarios. So if you take a look at the next picture here. But let me ask you one about this. So um, you, you mentioned that this assumes that there won't be any significant rollback of tariffs and, uh, and the policy around tariffs. Whatever the tariffs are now, they stay in place. I don't think okay, tariffs- But, that, but there may be a significant change with a change in administration. Okay, but I don't- This would affect the change in the chart, no? Yeah, I don't think, I think energy demand is not dramatically affected by tariffs. Unless you can make the case that the tariffs are having such a profound effect in global travel, global economic activity. Tariffs do impose a cost. These costs can be substantial, but they're not enough to move the meter on this thing. I don't think. Not not enough so that you can really see. I mean, I think I did see that there's been some research that the tariffs may have taken down a half a percent of GNP in the US. I don't think they've had the worldwide effect. And these are worldwide numbers. Uh -huh. So you look here at global primary energy demand growth by scenario, and you can see here that uh, if we get on what you may call a stated policy scenario, so we can kind of keep in place what we've got in terms of encouragement of investment, we don't really roll back a lot of our uh, initiatives for building out uh, new oil and gas development, new power development, renewable development. We're not going to get back to where we were in twenty in 2019 till 2022, and with a delayed recovery scenario, and that would assume a lot more lockdowns, a lot more constraints on letting uh, rec recovery in certain segments, travel industry particularly, we wouldn't get back to where we were until 2024, 2025. So the COVID is going to take a very long, a, lo a very near-term hit in the world uh, energy growth. But you know, you know if we had a uh, vaccine uh, yeah. come right away, not, not that that's going to happen, but if we had a vaccine come in the near term, and um, and and we had um, you know an economy that just took off with uh, you know with pent up demand and pent up desire to make money, pent up desire to work. You know, I mean, it's been such a short time we've been in COVID that some of these some of these aspirations um, are 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 huge, but 
that you can't realize them because everybody's scared about COVID. Yeah, I, but, I, I, but if 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 you if you if you let the thing just go, all of a sudden the coast is clear. It seems to me you would have a remarkable recovery. No, actually, I do think that the IEA is probably too conservative. That they're not, you know, they're trying to pick some mid, you know, some midpoint consensus forecast. But uh, you know, I like the your optimism. I share it. I think that this is a big problem in our whole society that we love these apocalyptic views of the world that we're all going to die and that uh, everything that's happening is bad. And in fact, there is when inherent in the American system, the American people, a great deal of optimism. And once we get the green light, I think a lot of people talk about we're going to see revenge tourism. You know, people are just going to start going places. And, I do think it will recover. I do think there will be some shifts. People have learned how to do meetings with this Zoom technology, but I can tell you, and and we 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 do we talk to each other. We have a, folks in London and and in Japan and around the world. And the Zoom using it more has really brought us together as a as an institute. But on the other hand, getting together in person it's it's not the same, and there's going to be a lot of interest in doing that. So. I think we may get a lot of efficiencies out of business meetings and, and things like this, but it remains to be seen. So. And then even, so if we go to the next picture, one of the things that as we go forward, right, it's important to remember that we still have a lot of people without electricity. So in any model, and I think I've talked to you I we've talked about this before. We should be very careful with a rich man's view of how to deal with climate. If we don't get these you know, carbon control technologies and these efficiency technologies migrated to the non-OECD world, it's not going to have, it's not gonna have nearly the kinds of effect you need. And if you think a bunch of people in Africa and uh, you've got in the, you know, the, even these specific countries in Africa, which is now 600 million people without electricity, they are not interested. I think there's enormous opportunities for solar, wind and hydropower. And we did have a, uh, a deep dive in Africa today, which we, we could do sometime. And I, and I think there's a lot of potential in Africa with improving interconnections of the grid and cooperation, but it's not a place that lends itself to that. But we should talk, we should talk about it on the show. Yes, we have a very interesting uh, uh, program looking at Africa. I do believe though that the Africans are gonna feel a lot of pressure to accelerate their development of hydropower and they will want to use coal. How they use that coal, what kind of technologies is very important because they don't want intermittent power. I think distributed solar can do a lot in Africa, but they need a lot of baseload power. Okay, so. Now here, the next chart I think is a very, uh, a very interesting one. And this is, if we took everything we have operating now, and then everything that's on the planning board, which will be built in the next few years, right? And we only did that. Right, that's all we did. We just built, which we, which the, for the blueprints, the stuff we're going forward and everything that we have now uh, in power industry and other, our carbon emissions would not start to decline until not, I mean, they wouldn't substantially come down until, you know, 2040 to 2050. Now keep in mind that chart on Africa, that's not in this chart. In other words, not only do we have to, uh, not only do we have all this built in CO2 emissions coming forward, we're going to have a lot more. So without some massive technological advances, we're going to have a problem meeting the so-called, uh, you know, two degree targets. Yeah, well, that's, that's the flip side of the question yeah. that I posed to you before. I mean, how long 
you know, how long is the lag time? So if you um, if you if you if you went to renewables, uh, how many years would it take to actually drop emissions uh, on a global basis? And this, that's a that's that's a great concern that it takes so long. In fact, if you go to the next picture, and just to reemphasize my point, the red is what has happened between 1970 and two th and the end of 2019 in uh, CO2 emissions for the non-OECD world, it means not Europe, not Japan and South Korea, not North America, right? Africa, um, Indo-Pacific, Asia, except for Japan and Korea. But that is where, that's where actually the low hanging fruit is, where the low cost solutions to reducing CO2. And as I said, if you go to my last, and you know, and so far, when I go to these conferences, when I talk to everyone, it's like the man looking for his keys under the light, under the street lamp, right? Everybody in the West has got money and they're really good at uh, figuring out transformation costs and how to do things. But as, as, I, as we point out, that's not really where the play is on CO2. It's a global problem. So that gets back to my, so to my last chart here, which is a kind of summary at a recent uh, virtual conference in Athens. Uh, I will, I, we won't, we, we're probably running out of time here, so let's not spend too much time on it. But I do think that it's time for the, the broader analytic community, economics, the community that I work to step back and thinking about this in a more holistic approach. We have a, as I said, we have a preoccupation with mandates, target and transitioning technologies, but we're not really measuring where is the high payoff for the lowest amount of money, right? Uh, you know, we're not doing a lot enough on timing of benefits and risk analysis. And by the way, we need to know about the econ environmental cost of net zero. If you remember the little, uh, the movie we talked about, if you're making those batteries and you're, you know, digging up all the cobalt mines in Africa with child labor, and polluting the rivers and things, well, you need to know about that. You need to include that all. So I do, and once again, I just want to emphasize my view that uh, I don't think supply constraints is a good solution for this. This is not how you fix this problem. You have to change our consumption patterns and you have to advance the technology. And you need to transfer that and get people on board in the non-OECD. I, I, I think that's really enlightened, Lou. Yep. Um, and, and this is a perfect opportunity for you and Eprink, isn't it? Uh, because you, you can see the picture, you can see the global picture. Uh, yeah. And now maybe COVID has uh, sort of expanded all of our collective thinking about how to, how to handle things going forward. And you could be instrumental in taking a close analytic look at that. You know, but much like the other folks in the post-COVID world, I suspect we'll be facing some extreme challenges next year to keep, uh, to keep going. We have a plan, but it's not gonna be fun. So my last question to you is we've been talking uh, in sort of a, in a, a combination of, of thoughts here. One is uh, what the IEA uh, you know, feels is the outlook, and the other is is what uh, Lou Pugliarisi feels is the outlook. So, how, how is is there is there agreement between you and the IEA? I don't think the IEA would necessarily disagree with these comments. I don't think they would necessarily. I think they would say, well, if we do this stuff in the West, then we can transfer it, or they can see what we're doing. But uh, I. As I said before, if you look at their documents, and there's very little work being done on mitigate on the adaption, which I think is really the near-term strategy. A lot of people need to think about more clearly, because we are not going to make some of these goals, you know, and we're going to have to adapt as well. Even this is a positive. It's a positive side of COVID. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it requires you to rethink going forward. I agree. Take Thanks. another look at it. Yeah. Well, Lou, thank, thank you very much. This has really been uh, very enlightening and um, I'm so glad we talked about this today and uh, I hope that you can 
um, you know, cover the, the African question in the near term and maybe the next show if possible. Yes, uh, I'll to take a look at it. Yeah, we'll do that. Okay. Okay. Aloha, Jay. Aloha. Thanks so much. Lou Pudirici of Ebring.